I wanted to start by saying I'm a pathological optimist, but the first part of my presentation is not going to seem optimistic. I'm hoping the second half will be, because that will be all about social prescribing, which I think is quite crucial to the reform, the second reform, or the second creation, recreation of the NHS. Uh, and I would all also argue the saving of the NHS. But just to give you some statistics at this moment in time, which won't make you very happy, I'm afraid, there are 7.7 .7 million people on the waiting list. That's something uh, you're talking about 4 million probably pre-COVID. Mental health, significant mental, serious mental health in children has gone up from 12 to 17% pre and post-COVID. If you take Scotland, one in four adults are on antidepressants. Um, obesity and overweight, 60% in this country. 15% in Norway. So I'm going to take you on a little tour of Norway, actually, as part of my presentation, to show that it doesn't need to be this way. And obesity is our generation smoking in terms of the impact on health. Obesity is not just an issue of overweight, it's actually an issue of malnutrition, and I'll give you a sense of what that is like, particularly in the East End of London. Quite a lot of this is based in the East End of London, and one of the things that COVID did was absolutely expand the inequalities. My community, where I work, got much iller and much poorer. There are 2,500 food banks in this country double the number of McDonald's outlets. There are one million people waiting on the waiting list in the community. But let me head to a bit of good news, and the good news is in primary care, because whatever you read, whatever your experience is, actually access to primary care and GPs has never been better. It actually, the number of consultations has gone up 10% compared to pre-COVID. And actually, when you see what GPs are doing with amazing IT systems, with Accurist, a whole raft of new systems, a lot of which were developed during COVID, actually, you've got a primary care system that is, I would argue, still one of the best in the world. And what will interest you has fantastic potential in terms of research. So our GPs locally in the East End of London under Queen Mary University, where I'm a professor, collect the 2 million database from the population of East London, 150 different ethnic minority groups. In DNA terms, we have the world in the East End of London. We collect all that data. We have the East London care record. We have the discovery project. We connect it to all the hospital data. We connect it to socioeconomic data. We can very accurately with somebody's postcode uh, give a sense of somebody's socioeconomic status. So you've got fantastic potential, which is why we're talking about a bioscience centre being based in the Royal London Hospital and some of the greatest genome projects and a whole raft of different research projects. And one of the messages I'd like to leave with you tonight is think of primary care if you're going to think of research in the future. You have access to an amazing community, an amazing amount of data which is grossly underused because traditionally there's been a very strong bias uh, towards the hospital sector. I'm on the board of NHS Resolution and a mental health trust, but I need to tell you now that the medical negligence cost, uh, and I say this, I am on the board because I used to be a barrister before I became a doctor, is now costing this country £2.7 billion pounds a year. Uh, when you think of the 150 billion pound budget in the NHS. That's a very significant proportion, actually, that's going on medical negligence, and it's just climbing from year to year. So that's the bad news. So now I'm about to take you on a tour of Bromley by Bow and the country and a touch of the world to, to talk to you about social prescribing. Now, why is social prescribing so important? Well, if you um, ever have the opportunity to get a presentation by Professor Marmot, he will tell you that probably only something like 20% of people's health and well-being is delivered by the NHS. That's probably an optimistic figure. 
But the worst news is that actually we cause a lot of damage. If you look at the over 65s, depending on where you are in the country, between 10 and 20% of admissions are as a result of side effects to drugs. One of my projects when I worked for Simon Stevens and we set up vanguards across the country, and I'll tell you a bit about those innovations, 50 of them uh, in all, actually we started seeing some of the um, some of these problems and some of these solutions, and I'll touch on some of these innovations. So what's the other 80%? If I'm being very simplistic about it, it's employment, education, environment, and creativity. And you'll get a taste of all of that when I take you around some of the 100 different projects at Bromley by Bow. In some ways, it's bleedingly obvious. So uh, I think I was talking to uh, our colleague here, actually, and um, I was saying that actually we were considered Guardian Reading Sandal Brigade nut jobs 30 years ago. Now, of course, I'm the pillar of establishment. Uh, but actually, still to this day, you get a lot of challenge. And I can give you some of the evidence base of social prescribing, but you still get a lot of challenge about it. And yet it's very obvious. Let me put it simply to you. If you get a job, if you get a good job, even better, but if you get a job, you will be wealthier and healthier, full stop. If you are unemployed, you will be less healthy. Once you've been unemployed for six months, it's almost impossible to reverse. And that is, I can only describe that to you by thinking about if I made you stay at home looking at four walls for two weeks, you'd be pulling your hair out. But just imagine what your mental health and physical health would be like. If you take an 80 year old, by the way, you put them in a hospital bed for 10 days, they lose 10% of their muscle strength. And it's the equivalent of 10 years inactivity. I'm starting to give you some of the, the facts actually, which have enormous impact on health. And yes, antibiotics, fantastic. And yes, we do brilliant biomedicine at Bromley Bibo, some of the best in the country. And I can illustrate some of that, but you will not create good health if you don't do what I'm talking about, if you don't combine it with social prescribing. Environment. Well, it might be something very simple as living near a main road. Um, you know, we have some of the highest rates of asthma and eczema in Tower Hamlets, almost invariably due to environmental factors. Creativity. I'll show you some of our art studios. Creativity, spirituality. This makes people better. The other thing that's really important about this is it diverts people from the NHS. That figure I gave you about antidepressants, part of that is the consequences of COVID, when actually it was very difficult to do social, social prescribing. Um, but part of it is the, is the constant drive around biomedicine. One of the things I was doing, which I was uh, talking to one of our colleagues over dinner, is I'm a professor at Queen Mary University and we're completely redesigning the medical school course. I would argue that actually most medical schools in this country are not delivering future doctors, let alone present doctors. There are still medical schools educating in the same way as I was educated 40 years ago. And when I talk to a group of GPs and I ask them, what percent of that knowledge that you learned at medical school do you still use? Probably the top figure is 5%. And when you think about the internet and the change in knowledge the scientific knowledge that we've heard about earlier on, how rapid it is, it's very easy to see how doctors can get out of date within a space of five or 10 years, which means your role is very different. I was the fount of all knowledge 40 years ago. You know, we didn't have the internet. The patients know a lot more than me and I encourage them to do that. And therefore my role as a doctor is to help them make difficult decisions to be a team leader, to be a teacher, that's very, very different to what it was in the past. And so I've been leading nationally a movement towards apprenticeship training to medical, uh, for medical students. And we're talking about them being based significantly in primary care for five years, and then postgraduate GP training being based in primary care for five years. Very, very different type of training. And so social prescribing is not just a challenge to biomedicine, it's also a very big challenge to the way we uh, teach people. So I ask you the question, are we teaching our medical students to make them fit 
to be doctors of the of the future. So let me take you on a tour of Bromley by Bow and social prescribing. Ah. That just makes the point, I would argue, that actually 1948, we need 1948 again if we're going to rescue, save the NHS. Daily Express uh, loves social prescribing, and its headline, which I adored, was social prescribing is going to save the NHS. Well, uh, a big part of it, a big part of it. Just to give you some facts and figures, it's a very different life in the East End of London. The inequalities have got worse. In COVID, I live right in, in social housing in East End London. I went for walks every day with my wife. We hardly ever saw our patients on the street. I shop in the local supermarket. There's whole trolleys without any fruit and vegetable. In Tower Hamlets, there's 42 chicken shops per secondary school. And I jest not when I say to you that actually my, my uh, food and nutritional recommendation to my patients is McDonald's. That's kind of the healthy end of the market in Tower Hamlets. Of course, COVID was quite devastating in the East End of London. We had the highest deaths uh, in the country. And tragically, because of a government and a system that went down the ages rather than the risk in terms of who got vaccinated first, by the time we got round to vaccinating the highly at risk groups in our community, of course, paranoia is set in with social media. So we had some of the lowest immunization rates in the country, despite giving very clear messages to the center, actually, that they needed to understand risk in individual patients. It wasn't all about age. So this is the food bank at Bromley by Bow on a Monday morning, starts at 6.30, finishes around one o'clock. And we give them coffee and we do a whole raft of things. We use it as a great opportunity to encourage people to use healthy food, to get a job, whatever it is. Um, but it's pretty tragic, isn't it? In the fifth richest country in the world that we have food banks. I was at BMA House. I was um, acting chair of the BMA at one point, And I was at BMA House when the bus bomb went off. And uh, I remember doing the media in the evening. I was terrified there was going to be a backlash against my Muslim community. But I remember thinking, actually, if you blow somebody up, you hate them. If you hate them, it's because often you don't know them. And you will also learn how we use social prescribing to bring communities together. I have a very big following among Muslim women who are veiled. That always takes people by surprise. People always come and visit me and say, well, obviously these women won't come and see you as a man. And I'll explain a bit later on why they do come and see me. But also we create an environment that is a safe space where a white young man sitting next to a Muslim woman is not an issue. But actually how often in our society does that inter intermingling happen? And if we don't have that intermingling, and working and living together, what are the consequences to our community? The consequences are disconnection. I will come on in a moment actually to talk to you about the importance for your health of connection to your family, to your community and to nature. And I'm gonna illustrate that by taking you on a very brief tour of Norway. So this is my family. <laughs> I have my uh, daughter there, who's um, a little bit embarrassed, probably, by uh, her picture being shown there. But um, Norwegians, 40% of them have houses, huts. You'll see this hut here uh, in the mountains. 20% have boats. Virtually everyone in Norway has access to nature. And it's very typical. I was talking to one of the coll colleagues in the break how typical it is actually in Easter and certain times of day to head up to the mountains and on the weekends, by the way. Uh, Norwegians have got it right in terms of the work-life uh, balance. And you head and you go up and you swim in lakes. Um, you go and pick mushrooms. You sit around a fire in the hut. Uh, there's a channel on the Norwegian um, NR Corps, Norwegian BBC, which literally is a fire burning 24 hours a day. And we call this Higge, but you probably hopefully have got that sense of well-being already from what I've described. But my patients 
never been out to the countryside, never seen a cow. This is quite extraordinary. It's quite an extraordinary different way of life. So that's the family. Uh, this is our family um, home up in the mountains. This is just a typical scene in Norway. You can just feel that beauty. You can feel better, actually, in that sort of environment. This is the center of Oslo. This is actually my eldest son. And um, in the center of Oslo, I, I did a sabbatical there uh, um, last year with my wife. And um, we spent three months there. And then this is the center of Oslo. By the way, I smelt a diesel car once. It has the highest number of electric cars in any country in the world. And this is the center of Oslo. Imagine that in the Thames, that you have sauna. So you can rent a sauna and then you're diving and swimming uh, in the fjord. Quite amazing. And that's just a very typical scene. I talked about 20% have boats. This is my cousin taking me out on a boat. By the way, flags is also something about the community. And I'll come on to this issue of a sense of community. You go to virtually any house in Norway and there'll be a flagpole. And uh, really, really important. This is about community. And if you ever get the chance, uh, go there on the 17th of May. I will show you pictures of that in a few moments. Uh, here you can see a Norwegian flag. But actually, this is our family home in Scotland. I just make the point that actually you can make it happen in this country, but we need to focus on green social prescribing. And actually, I'm part of a government project with a very senior civil service servant actually doing that at this very moment in time. Sense of community. So this is uh, national costumes. It's a bit like Scotland and, and kilts. Every valley has its own national costume. This is from Tielemark, quite beautiful national costumes. Um, addressing this issue of sense of belonging and belonging to a community. And of course, this is the 17th of May, which I strongly recommend that you put on your bucket list. You will have an incredible experience. So bands marching up the streets. So every school, virtually every class a year has its own brass band. I shouldn't have to say to you that music is healthy. It's you, you, you're part of a band, you're part of a group, you're doing something together, you're learning to be a team player and you're playing music. We use music therapy actually. One of the projects I did with the chair of the uh, ENO, opera com company, who came to me, he, was, uh, he used to be a GP ages ago and he was terrified about, well, the ENO's got problems at the moment, but actually in COVID, massive problems. And so we talked about what could they do? And we created a project called ENO Breathe, which was actually musicians, singers, training people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. One of the things that you will learn about Bromley by Bo is thinking out of the box, breaking the rules. I often say to everybody, I even say this as an ex-lawyer, if you're not breaking a rule this week, you're probably not doing the right thing. And just saying yes. The NHS is wonderful at saying no. Now, you will have experienced, I'm sure, in your worlds, the sort of way they say no. It's um, show us the evidence, show us the business case. I'm sure you can think of lots of other examples, but one of the philosophies of social prescribing is just to say yes. And so in a moment, I'll tell you about the Legauser and Flower Arranging Clinic that the district nurse set up and the impact that had. So fantastic sense of community. And I suppose I'll leave you the, with the question, how do we create the connections to nature, the connections to family, the connections to community that are absolutely critical to people's health and well-being? So this is Bromley by Bo, uh, quite a few years ago, uh, known by my patients as dog shit green. You all know lots of those uh, parks, not in Cambridge, but if you go into any city area, you'll see these parks that are kind of quite dangerous with dogs, um, not safe spaces. This is it today, uh, illustrating uh, one of the things we've got there is a cafe run by people with learning disabilities. 
So we're training people with learning disabilities. Two of my nieces have Down syndrome. They've been to university at Fox's Academy in Minehead for three years. I strongly recommend you go and stay in their hotel. You will be humbled by it and you will have the most amazing experience. And both of them are now living semi-independently and holding down jobs. And when as a good uncle, I went to visit them and, and said I would take them out uh, to dinner, they took me to the most expensive restaurant and ordered pink champagne. And then I knew that education was incredibly worthwhile, but that's what we do at Bromley by Bow with people with learning disabilities. So maybe that's something for Cambridge. What about a university for people with learning disabilities? And this is the entrance to Bromley by Bow. This actually came from the Strand in the 30s. Don't ask me why it was put on the wall of the park, but it was. And we thought, well, that would make a lovely entrance to the health centre. So we went to Tesco's and we, they gave us 20,000 to put it up. And then I said to them, so what can I do for you? And there was a bit of, well, hang on, we're Tesco's almighty. What could you possibly do for us? But I'd worked out with my colleagues that very few of the Bangladeshi community, about 50% of my community are from Bangladesh, used the shop. So we sat down with them. We talked to them about the foods, the celebration of Eid and the various festivals. And there was a cheeky moment a year later when I thanked them again for the 20,000. And I said, yes, and how much did we give you? Romley by Bo is a unique partnership between the private, the voluntary, the state sector, and the church. So you'll see a bit about the church later on. Notice also, actually, uh, I, some of you, I'm sure, remember John Reed, uh, the health minister, very gruff Glaswegian. Do you remember the days where they wanted to put NHS signs everywhere? It was all about branding the NHS. And he visited us and he was very irritated that there were no NHS signs here. And I said, yeah, but that's because this doesn't belong to the state, this belongs to the community. And then he got irritated because there was no sign post to tell you where to go. So I looked at him straight in the face and said, Minister, that's because we encourage our guests to get lost. He, he took a double take and then I explained what happened when you visit Bromley by Bow. Two things, you walk in and you either say, I'm lost, can you help me? Or somebody stops you and says, you look lost, how can I help you? And of course, this is why we should take all signs out of hospitals and ensure that all the patients get lost in all the corridors because the human communications and the well-being that goes with that will be quite amazing. And of course, this is our courtyard uh, with wisteria. You can imagine, lovely smell, all designed to relax patients down. I think doctors sometimes forget how terrified patients are. I always presume that a patient thinks they've got cancer or meningitis or something really horrible. Don't ever forget that as a doctor, otherwise you'll lose your humanity in the process. But therefore the design of the centers is absolutely critical. You go home to a nice warm house, a nice sofa, you feel better. This is very obvious stuff. But if you look at most health service buildings, they are ugly, unfriendly, unwelcoming, perfect for infection control, completely ignoring people's mental health. But you'll see the compromises and the rules we break on infection control so that we create a parity of esteem between biomedicine and mental health. And of course, we have a fountain and a fish pond. Actually, what you can't see is there's a rack there, so you can't fall in and drown yourself. There again, attention to details. This is the leg ulcer and flower arranging clinic. So the district nurse came uh, to us, to me, and said, I want to set up a leg ulcer clinic. We had very serious problem with leg ulcers in elderly women who had lost their self-esteem, become immobile, housebound, had smelly wounds, a vicious cycle. What we did was dress them brilliantly with new, we mobilized them and we brought the joy back into their lives. So this is not now a leg ulcer and flower arranging clinic. They now call themselves the Young at Art because they're doing a whole raft of different art projects. That's what I mean by um, saying yes to people 
who want to be innovators. I'm sure people have been saying yes to you and that's why you've, you're doing what you're doing. Uh, but also thinking completely out of the box, away from traditional medicine. You come into our waiting room area, lovely, warm wood against the infection controls, flowers. Well, they're virtually banned in hospital these days. Um, and then notice some of the difference. Now, um, I never wear a tie. I haven't in 34 years as a GP, never wore a white coat. Uh, I never use my title. The patients all know me as Sam, and they have all those years ago. I gave them the notes 34 years ago to read in the waiting room. A completely different way of thinking. Yes, I use my titles occasionally, and I always warn people, if you get an email from me with my titles, professions, uh, watch out, I'm after something. We Notice we sit next to patients. Think of your experiences in the health service, actually. This is about partnership working. Yes, you have to be flexible as a doctor. And at times, particularly actually with doctors as patients, you'll be very directive because they're so terrified. You almost, that's the only way to calm them down. But the vast majority of the time, this is about a partnership with patients. And an equal partnerships where you're negotiating and persuading them to make changes in their life. We have a stained glass artist. So uh, the artists were very much the founders of the center. And why? Well, quite a lot of it's organic what we do. Um, it was because we had squats down the road and they need, needed workspace and we had workspace. This is actually my ECG. So Sheena, I sat down with her and um, we thought, well, what, how can we make the windows a bit more attractive? Um, and uh, we came up with this idea. And in fact, if you ever want some stained glass, do think of going Sheena, amazing stuff. She's just doing my coat of arms at the moment. So there might be one or two people who are interested in that here. Anything for a party. So in the summer, we text all 15,000 of our patients. So that's not the whole group. We have 50,000 patients. Text them and said, come along to a party uh, in the park. It was completely packed. It was a lovely day too, which helped. And this is doing egg and spoon race. And um, I'm not going to tell you who's a patient and who's the managing director of a big bank in the city. But that's also what happens, actually. You get a great blending of people um, in, in a setting like Bromley by Bow with a great sense of joy. Uh, if you have, Most of the time, if you ever get an email from me, you'll see a vision statement, which isn't about fantastic primary care. No, it's about fun, friendship, compassion, and assume it's possible. And that's what we say and we are about for many years. Paralympics, obviously the Olympics is just down the road from us. So we do a lot of uh, Paralympic sports in the, in the park. This is on the left is Paula, our stone sculpturist. Uh, this is our jobs advisor. So we have jobs advisors. Um, we prescribe uh, gardening. These are some of the allotment gardens there. This is uh, Fatima, who's uh, been with us about 25 years, amazing advocate. So I was, she was in surgery with me this morning with a lot of uh, our elderly Bangladeshi patients who don't even after many years speak English. And she's just, um, just amazing as a, an advocate, knows everyone in the community. And of course, that is the power of a good general practice. It comes, by the way, the importance of the continuity of care and the connection of the community, the power of that in scientific terms comes from a really critical Norwegian study published about three years ago, which showed categorically clearly that you will have higher pickups of cancer and serious illness with continuity of care. Absolutely critical. Yes, if you're young and you've just got chest infection, you need an antibiotic, less important. But actually, interestingly, continuity of care for everyone will massively reduce your morbidity and mortality. And this is a group she set up called Grannies in the Kitchen. She also runs a walking group. This is the front of our cafe. It's called our welcome zone, which is fundamentally where the social prescribers hang out. And you can walk in there, use one of the laptops, help yourself to a cup of coffee and ask for help for anything, whether it's loneliness, your plumbing problem, the mold in your house, whatever it is. And that's because what we focus on, and this is quite critical to social prescribing, is not what the matter is with somebody, 
people, but what matters to them. And this is really critical change because all our training in medicine was, you're a diabetic, you've got Parkinson. But actually, if you look at all our projects, they're not defined by disease, they're defined by what the project does. And that's really important because holistic healthcare, particularly with an aging population, becomes increasingly important. We're a community university, so we do NVQs, all sorts of different trainings, which transforms people's lives. We started as a church, as a United Reformed Church, um, and uh, this is my wedding 10 years ago. And um, this is Lord Mawson, he's now in the House of Lords, he's the founder, uh, he's the vicar. And um, it's, there's also a very key philosophy here for the church. I remember my first wife, who was a, an amazing woman, Asian tiger mum, says it as it is. And I remember my, when my 28 year old uh, was when we adopted her and um, she, uh, she was going to be christened. And uh, my wife at the time said to Andrew, Andrew, I've got a problem. I don't believe in God. Now, 28 years ago, that was a real showstopper, wasn't it? It was probably still a showstopper in some churches. He just looked her straight in the face and he said, oh, no, that's not a problem. Now, what do you want in a service? So herein lies a very critical message for a, a church, which I would say is obsessed with things so distant, actually, to the reality of people's life. We have Muslim festivals in the church. We have people visiting from us around the world to get a taste of what we're doing. We have champagne served from the altar. Andrew and I love champagne, so it was very obvious to us that rather than wine at the end, we should serve everyone champagne and the vicar would serve it to everybody. We have an amazing teams. I like to tell people I am not a brilliant doctor, but I am brilliant because of my team. The Bawagawa case, do you remember the doctor who came off maternity leave and was done for manslaughter? Classic, classic illustration, actually, of the importance of team. You, it's not good enough to be a good doctor. If you don't have a good team and a good system in place, you will not deliver. If you don't have a system that delivers biomedicine and social medicine, you're not going to deliver either. I hasten to add, too, that I've never had a case against me for medical negligence in all my years as a doctor. That's a very keep my fingers crossed for my remaining years. But that's incredible because most doctors can expect at least three or four in their lifetime. And that comes from an amazing team. Um, Kirsty's mum and my, my wife is one of them. Practice nurse, full profit sharing partner for 25 years. Pretty unusual, pretty unique. One of these here is a phlebotomist. No qualifications, no GCSEs, not very literate a brilliant clinician. She takes the blood off all those people with long-term conditions. She knows them all. So when a patient came in and said, oh, she noticed, she, she looked a bit off and she said, well, what's wrong? And, and uh, she started saying, well, you know, I've, it's burning when I pee. So she tested her urine and she had nitrites in it. And she rang through to me and said, and there was back pain. She rang through to me. This is somebody with no qualifications at all. Rang through to me and said, Sam, this patient's got pyelonephritis. Can you see them? That's what happens when you have teams. That's what happens in Tower Hamlets, where for years we train, we close every practice for half a day a month, and we all train together. You will see a receptionist training with a doctor. And that's the power also of medicine there. This is Claire. She's happy for me to tell you about her story. Throat cancer, so her voice box was taken. And uh, of course, she couldn't work in her old job. So she came on some of our art courses, didn't like it. Came on our IT courses, loved it. Now back in employment. Getting people back after illness into employment, absolutely critical. I talked about the vanguards, which I led for Simon Stevens across the country. And this is an amazing vanguard. I, I want to ask you a question though, first of all. You're terminally ill. Do you choose to die in hospital or at home or in your community surrounded by your loved ones? I actually know the answer. I don't even need to ask you to answer that question. 
The only time I've ever had anyone say they wanted to die in hospital was a chief exec of one of our local hospitals. And I'm not sure whether that was loyalty to her hospital or she just didn't have any loved ones. But 47% of our terminally ill patients are dying in hospital. This project reduced it to 15%. And we do that in our general practices. How do we do it? Very simple tricks. We hold people's hand throughout the terminal illness. So that when a, a young woman uh, with her mother who was terminally ill, they were living together, terrified of managing a terminal illness. Most people don't see death in this day and age. And I held her hand throughout, managed the terminal illness. They get my mobile phone, they get my email. They can ring me or text me anytime they like. And in a surgery, mum died, she rang up and just said, and you can get a sense for it from what she said, oh, my mum's just passed away. Could you pop around at some point? Now, just think how that transferred from somebody who was terrified to somebody who successfully managed and given the greatest gift you can give to your loved ones in life, which is a good death. And so I went around there, typical Bangladeshi family, flat, absolutely packed with lots of people. So you have to do the kind of, what I call the equivalent of the last rites as a doctor in front of everybody. And then I sat down, did the death certificate, very important to Muslim and Jewish communities to bury their loved ones within 24 hours, and just sat there and said to her, if I could speak for your mother today, I would tell you what a fantastic job you've done. Cheaper, better, less bereavement among families, and yet 47% are still dying in hospital quite a scandal. And I often describe one of my jobs as a GP as to protect people from oncologists, or we cheekily call them living in barmers in the East End of London, because they always tantalize you with that 5% five-year recovery. And what a patient hears is, I might live. Whereas actually what a scientist, scientist like me would say, well, excuse me a sec, that's not gonna, that's just not a reality. Amazing group, so we got and supported 20 people to put a project. They had to put their, their it was a hall like this actually, it's a church hall, and they had to present their project. They'd never spoken in public before, but it was like Dragon's Den. They had to pitch for a thousand pounds. There was only gonna be a thousand pounds for their project, and there were 20 people pitching. And we nurtured and supported them to do this. Quite incredible. And I was on tenterhooks actually, because they were, they were so magnificent. I was literally about to get my checkbook out because I didn't know that secretly the business that was uh, sponsoring this had agreed actually to give everyone the money. But it was such fun and so amazing and so creative. And you can imagine the trickle down effect in that local community in health terms with some amazing projects, including science projects actually for children. This is one of our doctors running our DIY project. So this is young mums and dads teaching them about managing minor illness, eczema, coughs, colds. Now here's some of the evidence. So it reduced reattendance in general practice by 30%, but quite stunningly reduced attendance in casualty by 30% too. One of my colleagues who's a surgeon at the Royal London Hospital, Professor Martin Griffiths, does social prescribing too. He got fed up with sewing up people with knife who had knife wounds. And if you know the East End of London, a lot of these inner city areas, the people who get knifed are also the people who do the knifing. It's gang culture. He gave them social prescribing for six, up to six months afterwards and reduced reattendance in casualty from 30% to 1%. So you begin seeing some of the evidence. What I think will seem very natural to you from what I've described in social prescribing, almost obvious, actually has a very strong evidence base to it too. This was a project we did at the Royal Society of Medicine. These kids came from a school in the Midlands, worked with GPs, by the way, had never seen an aubergine before, never grown half this stuff. So they grew a lot of their fruit and veg. And we had a, a food conference with international people, a hall full of 600. And these kids never presented before, presented in front of 600 people, went to Buckingham Palace first time, come down to London first time, 
they were amazing. You could hear, feel people choking in the room, actually. Uh, what an incredible change this had made to these children's lives. And this is a colleague of mine who's a GP in St. Austell, 30,000 community. If you ever visited it as a tourist, you'd think quite beautiful, but like a lot of Cornwall towns, actually very deprived, connecting in with the Eden Project. This is Mike Dixon, uh, who's uh, the College of Medicine. You might want to look it up. I'm deputy chair. This collects social prescribers around the country. This is his um, uh, general practice in Devon. And he's got a herb garden, um, medicinal herbs. He, by the way, was until recently the Prince of Wales GP and health advisor, and is now as a GP, is head of King Charles's household, which is um, very exciting, the first time ever for a GP. I've been working with Steve Khan at the whole concept of undergrounds. If you look at the millions who pass through every day through an underground station, what a fantastic health opportunity. Why wouldn't you supply fresh water? Why wouldn't you have signposts to the local swimming pool? So there's th something about thinking out of the box in terms of your assets all the way through. This was one of our Vanguard projects that reduce acute admissions to hospital, acute admissions, and we're talking about psychosis and serious illness, by a third. How? Opened up a cafe seven days a week staffed by healthcare workers. And uh, owl therapy. Now, I have no idea why this works, but this is a psychologist. If, if you're a doctor, you'll realize that, that children with autism are the most difficult patients to treat and manage. There's something about owl therapy, and I can't tell you what it is, but actually an owl in the room somehow grabs their attention and just changes the dynamic uh, completely. So that's, um, that's Bromley by Bow. Uh, you've got a sense also that it's spread very, very widely. Uh, people will say, well, we've never seen anything like Bromley by Bow anywhere else, but actually it is. It's across the country. It's different in anywhere you go. If you go to Leicester, a friend of mine who's a GP there, has got a police station in her waiting room, little blue light above the room. Uh, had a dinner with the superintendent, they came up with this idea. They reduced the crime rate on the local housing estate to 20% of what it was. And the policemen are liked, it's a new experience for them. It was very simple. Why don't you put a distrusted policeman in a deprived community, that's what happens, with the most trusted professional, and guess what? Suddenly you find great intelligence gathering. We have a retired policeman actually, who's one of our potters. And uh, lots of young men come in and, and have hypothetical discussions with him. So great examples, great examples now across the world. We're now doing an international conference every year. We have people coming from governments all around the world to Bromley by Bow. And I leave you with an invite. Do come, taste, smell, and see it because that will be the thing that will convince you most of all. It's the thing we learned years ago, actually. It's the thing that changes things. They kept on asking for cases, videos, paperwork and everything, but you come here and you will understand it and you will understand it on a personal level because there will be something in your life that will resonate here. It might be your mother who's got breast cancer, a grandparent who's got dementia, whatever it is, you will find something here, you will steal it and go back and do something very different. And I'll leave you with the final thought is everything we've done here has been stolen from somebody else. So break the rules and steal. Sam, thank you, that was brilliant. Um... I'm sure we're all thinking pretty hard. Uh, I'm sh and I'm sure there are going to be some questions. You, that has a sort of Tom Lira plagiarise quality about it. The, that does. Like, oh. Yes, the, the steel. Yes. 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 Well, we talked about it in dinner, didn't we? We talked about uh, plagiarism, didn't we? Uh, <laughs> um, so hands are going up. Uh, Thank you. As that was said, absolutely brilliant, wonderful. Um, you talked about, if I'm quoting you correctly, social prescribers around the country. Um, how extensive is it? Is it on the up? And how does that compare with other countries, e.g. Norway? 
Yeah, so uh, we're way ahead of other countries. So 10 years ago, as the chair of the CCG, holding the budget for every patient in Tower Hamlets, I put it in every practice. Four years ago, I persuaded government to put in every practice in the country. Now, it's not as advanced as ours. I mean, we've taken 30 years to get here, but actually every practice has a designated social prescriber. And by the way, uh, if you're wondering why we call it social prescribing and social prescribers, uh, I'm going to tell you a little secret, which I told to the head of all the heads of the NHS, when one of them, actually it was the chief medical officer, stood up and said, I don't really like the word, it sounds like socialist. And then somebody else said, oh, it sounds very biomedical prescribing. And I looked at this person, because uh, they were winning over the audience, and I looked at them, I said, look, I'll tell you a secret. We called it social prescribing because it's a secret conspiracy to re-educate all the doctors and nurses in the country using their language. But don't tell them. Thank you. I think I heard you say something that seemed a bit astonishing at the beginning, that one in four adults in Scotland was on antidepressants. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm. you can probably tell from the accent, and I have started going back to Scotland quite a lot. Um, is there anything that you would attribute that to? And the second question, you also said something at, at, at the beginning about, <clears throat> I can't remember exactly how it was phrased, but I think I, I interpreted it rightly or wrongly as suggesting that the GP's practices were actually better than they were many years ago. Um, do you think that's true of Scotland? Because um, it's, we, you know, we all have our own anecdotal experience, but it's certainly not my ex impression from people I know in Scotland. Hmm. So I love Scotland, as you can well understand, but actually some of the health statistics are pretty grim. And the education also. I mean, it, it, these things go hand in hand. They're down. I, I mean, Glasgow is considered the drug capital of the, of the country, you know, and of Europe. Um, major, major problems. The the antidepressant. Yes, it's real. It's actually that stats comes from the Times, Scottish Times today. Uh, I was I was working out before I came here what it was in England. It's quite difficult. We think probably one in seven, one in six. Actually, I'm just I was trying to work out a ballpark figure, uh, but it, it's a major problem and it's driven in two directions, worse mental health, but also the medical profession have to take great responsibility to this. Actually, if you have a medical profession that's taught biomedicine from day one, the temptation is going to be prescribed under COVID that was even more tempting. But actually, any consultation you can imagine in my setting with somebody with depression, I mean, fine, if they're psychotic, that's a different territory, is going to be a discussion around their diet, their purpose in life, their exercise. You have got to virtually squeeze my arm to get a sick note out of me. Because actually, if I, I described what happens if you do a sick note, keep somebody at home looking at four walls, absolute disaster. So actually, a lot of our doctors are not properly trained. And we, we have created quite an epidemic, actually, of mental health. Don't get me wrong, I don't blame it all on the medical profession. Mental health, for some reason, in this country has got worse. It doesn't have to be their way. It's not that way in, in Norway. Um, COVID, by the way, was very damaging. It wasn't in Norway. Thousand deaths. Actually, the only business that needed furlough in Norway was the undertakers. Less people were dying. But you could understand from those pictures I was showing you why mental health would have suffered so much less. Thank you. <clears throat> Fascinating talk. Um, you highlighted at the beginning of the lecture the severe problem of obesity in the UK. Um, if you want to see the extremes, go to the US. But do you think that social prescribing has the power to defeat the machinations of the food industry because they are leaders in making us obese? Yeah. Um, well, what can I say about the food industry? Uh, in my early days as a junior doctor, I was a graffiti artist, cigarette graffiti artist. Even got arrested, actually. So I'm, which I'm, I, I proudly told the... Um, the interview panel when I, I before I was put on the GMC council. 
Um, I remember a 40 year old with two young kids dying from smoking from lung cancer. Uh, obesity, the food industry, because actually it's not just obesity, actually in a community like mine, you can have skinny kids that are malnourished. You know, in the third world, I don't know whether you remember, there was kind of two types of malnutrition. You either had somebody who was plump with stick feet, or you had somebody that looked like a wizened old man. Uh, that's the equivalence now. And I, I like actually to use the word malnutrition, not obesity, because that's really what it is. And so I have skinny kids who are enormously malnourished, and a lot of the kids uh, who are, are obese malnourished. You know, when I trained at medical school, diabetes was a disease of the elderly. I'm seeing it in teenage years. This is this is quite shocking. No, this is a this is an epidemic of massive proportions. The solution lies in having a government that cares and understands quite bluntly, um, and then doing all these different things that you need to do. The the green prescribing. Transforming schools, I've got a campaign to have a nurse in every school. We run the nursing service as a group of 35 social enterprise general practice in Tower Hamlets. There's only one nurse per six schools. Uh, I was a, a, um, a, a governor of a primary school for 10 years. Why would you not have a nurse in every school and on every governing board? In Norway, there's a massive focus on health, on kids. My, my kids are vitamin deficient, vitamin D deficient. How can they possibly achieve educationally if you haven't got the basic nutrition, the basic feeding of the brain, correct? So uh, yeah, you've, you've started me on something, and but the solution are multifactorial, but it needs to, for people to understand in the same way they understand, understood with cigarettes, the seriousness of the issue. Sorry, thank you very much and um, very inspiring. But how do, I mean, is it an issue of getting people to overcome, I need a pill? Uh, you know, not post-social, that people are, you know, this concept that I must have drugs, I must have medication because that's what they've been dealt with. And two, is there actually resistance from some GP practices? I mean, I talk about mine, post-COVID, treble the number, well, it's not an exaggeration, but grossly inflate, uh, increase the number of receptionists. You can physically go in there and there's not actually, although there's 10 doctors officially there, not a doctor in the building. Um, so how do you overcome, so they're not looking at social prescribing, but how do you over, uh, overcome patients wanting a pill? So uh, there is a shortage of GPs and that, that's a major problem. And we've, we've got around that with teamwork. Uh, all our patients with an urgent problem see the same day. Everyone is seen within the week. Uh, it, it's possible, and that's in a deprived area. So a lot of this is about systems and teamwork, definitely. You have what I call um, a mutual addiction between the doctor and the patient. So your cholesterol's raised, and um, so I've got the solution. I've got a statin that's going to solve your problem. And you're very happy because you can carry on eating junk food and rubbish and not exercise. It's great because I've got a magic pill. We love magic pills. Both of us do, actually, as clinicians, because it solves the problem. And we're under massive pressure all the time. We deal with our pressure, by the way, by not having 10-minute appointments. Everyone has telephone triage. And actually, then I slot in patients that need to be seen within the telephone, and they never have to wait more than five or 10 minutes when they come up. So you might get a telephone call from me this morning, and I might say, much to your surprise, can you come up now? Oh, well, it would take me a bit of time. Yeah, just tell me. How long will it take you to get here? Uh, so there's that. And what was the other part of the question? Because there was tons of points in. Yeah. Yeah. But also, that I think, certainly my needs are touching. I don't believe in Cambridge, so we're okay. Yeah. Um, there is resistance. It comes across as resistance to actually living and seeing the patients. Yeah. That's my impression. I'm not saying. So, so a lot of it's re education uh, of doctors, to be quite honest. 
uh, as I say, I go back to if you're just taught in biomedicine and you've never learned any of this stuff, it's not, it's not, it's really interesting. It doesn't come from patients. You know, I had a patient the other day who was suicidal. And you might have expected me to jump in with an antidepressant. By the way, there's very little evidence, except under severe depression, that they have much impact. Um, actually, the conversation was all along the life circumstances, her job, um, her diet, her, um, her exercise. Then I emailed her a leaflet, things I wanted her to read actually, because I was going to ring her back in one week's time. By the way, even if you do prescribe an antidepressant, you are lucky if you get even a vague benefit within three weeks. So actually, somebody in that severe crisis needs something very immediate or that sense of, imagine there, imagine you're in a dark cave with no light at all. That's what a severe depression feels like. So my conversation will be trying to negotiate and work out what is that one small thing they can change within a week. And sometimes it's about going for a walk with their dogs. Sometimes it's just about eating a bit more healthier. It means in a week's time, when we have a, a deeper discussion about the choices and options, actually they're able to say, well, I have changed something. In other words, they've got back an element of control, which you lose with severe anxiety and depression. And it's those skills as a doctor, it's like, Patients really get surprised when I, I say to them, so what are you going to do for somebody else? And it's sort of the first thing is, what are you talking about? I'm the person who's ill. Well, there's very good evidence that actually if you do something for somebody else, it will improve your mental health. And actually, if you explain that in simple English and language, patients absolutely get it. Now, our biggest problem is our profession, actually, to be quite honest, and their education. Patients absolutely get this stuff. It's very logical. It's, it's not complicated science. Implementing it is, but it's not complicated. Um, it, it looks like you were fortunate to have plenty of space at your practice to be able to do all these things. How does that work out with practices which haven't got that sort of space? And secondly, there have been a lot of new uh, GP practices built in recent years, to what extent has the NHS dictated how they should be built and, and has, has compromised or made difficult trying to uh, implement social prescribing? Yeah, um, so I'm on the Ministerial Infrastructure Board and I was a non-executive director of community health partners that built about 300, for the, uh, it's an NHS body, 300 um, general practices are, are around the country. And... Um, 50% of general practice buildings are not fit for purpose. 50% are owned by the GPs. So you have a major problem. And by the way, there's no capital in the system. And you have an obsession from politicians always with the acute sector. And this is one of the disasters in this country. You know, you're not going to... It's really interesting that productivity went up 10% with less GPs and less resource in primary care. That investment and far more consultants over the last 10 years did nothing in terms of productivity in the acute sector. The acute sector and more hospitals are not going to get us through the problem. In terms of new premises, there are kind of two things. One is, so I've been talking uh, with the minister about going back to the past. Do you remember the days when people used to collect money for community hospitals? That's what we need in every community, something that's owned, as Bromley by Bow is, by the community. M money paid for by the local community, there isn't, there isn't more money from the taxpayer. But actually, if you create a vibrant centre like this uh, in your local community, you're not going to struggle too much to get finance. Of course, one of the things you need to do is have a different ownership model. So this is a charity, a church, a whole raft of different things. As long as you leave it on the treasury books, you've got a problem. But imagine setting up the equivalent of the National Trust, in other words, a charity that owns these buildings, which would enable you to get funding from all sorts of different sources. We need to think completely differently about how we resource the NHS. You see, what, what you're doing here is actually you're looking at a patient and saying they're a resource. I don't look at a patient just and say, what can I do for you? I look at a patient and say, no, what can you do for me? What can you do for my community? 
how, which project can you lead? And once you start looking at, at the resource, actually, they start investing themselves. There's a very strong culture that people don't pay for anything in their health service. The, the, you'd be amazed people will come in sometimes because they'll get a free prescription. And you think, why would you do that? Why don't you value your time more? And why don't you invest your money, your family time and resources, actually, in your health? And that's the culture we need to change. And this is a very subtle, I think, and clever way of doing it without people realizing they're actually digging into their pockets. Uh, thanks, Sam, for a tremendous talk, really inspiring. Um, you mentioned diabetes as one of the on oncoming great problems. There's another D that's going to roll over us, which is dementia. Mm -hmm. Is there a social prescribing approach to dementia and dementia prevention? Oh, gosh. Uh, I think that's more in the hands of the scientists. We, we do know some uh, preventions to it, actually. Uh, very obvious obesity, um, general ill health. Uh, so there's a whole raft of things. But the reality is we're getting older and we're all going to, we're increasingly going to be su suffering from long-term conditions, which, by the way, is the importance of intervening at a very early stage, which is what we do. We, by the way, have a local contract, 11 million contract for all our GPs to proactively manage all of diabetes so that virtually no patient with type 2 diabetes goes to the hospital. That's incredibly unusual. So you've got the prevention, stopping people getting ill, and that's the smoking, the, the lifestyle, the obesity, and then you've got intervening in the illness at a much earlier stage. But I can't promise you, I wish I could promise you that we would be getting rid of dementia. We can reduce it. And certainly the vascular dementia, and don't forget there's two types. You've got the Alzheimer's and the vascular. The vascular almost relates to your diet, your diabetes and your smoking. That's where we can have the biggest gains. I, I forget where it was, but I was reading it was either the New York Times or the yeah. Economist that there's a recent report that indicates that rates of dementia are falling in the developed world um, for reasons not entirely understood but, but it's not quite the epidemic it's, it's still a problem but not quite as bad as was predicted uh, there's a question at the back uh, yeah thank you for the talk uh it was, it was very inspiring um, I also grew up in, in Tower Hamlets. Uh, I actually was born in the rural London. I think you, you shared a, a few photos from there. Um, you mentioned earlier in the talk that you switched from law to medicine. You trained as a barrister. I was just wondering if you would, could look, elaborate on your career path and why you decided to go into medicine from law. And then <laughs> also, if it's, if it's, um, it's okay to ask two questions. You mentioned redesigning medical school uh, yeah. through your affiliation with Queen Mary. Um, is there any... What do you feel like is a downside to how medicine is taught now and the changes you want to sort of implement for new medical students? Because um, I know uh, there's a lot of uh, struggles with junior doctors, specifically in the NHS. Um, um, and so I don't know if that, I mean, that's a, a separate issue, but um, I, I don't know if that will change uh, infrastructure or these other things. I mean, that's a very big question on the, the junior doctors. It's very interesting. I ran, I was a radical junior doctor in 89, and I ran the junior doctor's house campaign and slept outside the, the Royal London Hospital. We were, my campaign was to reduce the hours from 84 to 72 a week. Quite extraordinary. It was a bit like Oliver Twist saying, can I just have a little bit better life? And uh, we won a new deal from Virginia Bottomley without any striking or anything like that. But... Uh, and I don't like to say it was better in our days, but actually we were part of a team. We had consultants who took responsibility for mistakes we made. We, we were nurtured, loved. The matrons and sisters told us what to do. Thank God, because we didn't know what the hell we were doing. You know, it was very different. And that, that team approach has disappeared. The strike that you're seeing at the moment is not just about pay. It, it's way beyond that. It's a lot of junior doctors very unhappy, working daytime, nighttime, no continuity of education and training, something you know about in Cambridge. You've got a nurturing academic environment here. Actually, they're going through this apprenticeship training as a junior doctor and nobody really cares or is interested in them. Hence our idea that you will spend five years in general practice. And that, that's a, a beginning of a very long story. Um, if I go to my career, so I am. Um, I come from a family of seven kids, 
uh, my father was a barrister. My mother was a, um, a Norwegian air hostess. And um, they met at, at a party. They were about 12 years distant. My father was 36 and a, um, living at home with his mummy and never having had a relationship. Ten years later, seven kids. Life had changed for him. Um, I then went to live in Norway when I left school at 17. I worked as a welder in a shipbuilding yard in uh, Stavanger and um, and came back and did a three-year degree because it seemed I was an argumentative character. You'll probably get a sense of that. So my parents rightly thought that, that the law was the right place for me. But I realised halfway through this wasn't me. And in fact, I went all around the country, including to Cambridge, to all the medical schools, to see if anyone would accept me. They wouldn't until I'd finished my law degree. And I ended up at the Royal Free and always wanted to be a GP. And uh, I often say to people, because there's a lot of doom and gloom. I was talking to some students the other day, you know, and they were saying, oh, everyone's leaving and they're giving up and 50% are leaving after they've qualified and all this sort of thing. And I looked at them and I said, what are you talking about? It's the most fabulous job in the world. You know, and to be quite honest, it's one of the best paid. You will be in the top 10% of payment. You will have one of the best pensions. So what is, go what is going on? And that's why I said earlier on, it's not all about the money. It's the whole raft of other things that are going wrong within the system. But I walk with a, a spring in my step in every day into surgery. I'm 66 and I still love my work. And I couldn't have wished for a better life. So being a doctor, absolutely fantastic. And uh, yes, you probably get a sense of along the way, I've graffitied cigarette advertisements. I got arrested and charged with fraud with a friend of mine who's a professor at Manchester University. We sent fake applications to jobs. One had an Indian surname, one had a traditional English surname, half as likely to get an offer for a job interview. Uh, we got on the Today programme and then the superintendent invited us in and sort of with a smile on his face said, don't do it again. But he was, I think he was quite proud actually of what we'd done. Um, and that actually also is, a, is something that medical school students need to be taught. They need to be able to, to be taught to stand up and public speak. That's what a modern doctor needs to be. They need to be a leader. They need to be taught how to be a leader. Um, they need to think much more widely about how they deliver healthcare. Um, but a fantastic job and a great opportunity. And by the way, shortage of doctors. Wow. From a market perspective, you can you can write your own check, demand flexible employment, whatever it is you want. You'll get it. That's probably the perfect moment to uh, stop the questions. We have the most wonderfully positive evening. It, it was the, the sense of what is what can be done. It just comes across so powerfully. It, it's it's uh, uh, so much to think about. Th thank, you. thank you. That was brilliant.